Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. We started on a series of love. Hallelujah. And so last week, I labored to bring you to the realization, to speed your spirit up to the realization of that love. And I touched on how you are formed in your mother's womb and how much he loved you and before you were formed he knew you and how he shaped you within your mother's womb and he needed your destinies, your days are in his palms, your hair falls off and he knows each number that falls off. God spoke a lot, God spoke a lot, God ministered a lot, okay, to us in that love and you felt, eh, God loves me. Isn't that how you felt? Because if we don't feel that, then we cannot give it. If we don't see how much God loves people, we cannot love them. You understand what I'm saying? And so the showing is simply a result of the seed of the love that has been realized and given by God. And so today now I'm moving from um, the realization as I continue slowly, steadily and deliberately. As I move from the realization, I'm now tending to the giving of the same. Okay? And... I start this with a story many years ago when I was, you know, uh, just awakened deeply into certain realities of the spirit and um, um, had several encounters in a certain period of time. God started to speak to me uh, concerning this particular issue. And one day he made a statement, a very profound statement. And when he made that statement, I sought so as I continue to hear that statement, as the Lord impressed it on my heart, I started to look for scriptural backing because I am someone who respects so much the authority of scripture in any spoken word, prophetic word of knowledge, word of wisdom, call it whatever you want it. For me, I believe if God has spoken, there has to be biblical foundation that can back what God has said. Now. For me, because I've seen God, I've walked with Him, <laughs> I know God. I'm not so excited by it. Oh, this happened. Whoa. Then I say, oh my God. No, no. As I continue to know God, certain things no longer excite me. I'm not saying that they are not relevant and necessary in the body of Christ by application and design. They are ordained. But the things that catch me as I grow in God are different. Okay? So be accurate all you want. If you're a prophet, I respect prophets, but if I cannot get scriptural basis of your accuracy, my light will go on immediately and start indicating, chua, 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 chua. I can't help it because the man I learned from many years ago was a man of the world. You get it? He was a man of the world and he was very deep prophetic. but. He was a man of the word. So I don't know any other way. That's how I was raised. I was raised in a way that when you talk about the word of God and the gifts and signs and anointings that follow, do anything you want as long as you have scripture. You can even fly. I'll fly with you. But once you vie off, eh, my lights go on. That's how I am. And that's how all of you now have become. By sitting under this anointing. So even you, I think you found yourselves over that. You're not easily moved by, you know, you make the lemon walk, but if you can't pick a revelation, yeah, there the lights start going on. You understand? Because that's how we are. That's the DNA we are made from. And then, so in hearing God, you know, this morning the Lord instructed me hmm, to teach a certain place. Some of you realize that God speaks differently to us. And if you have a certain understanding, God will speak to you a certain way. Every time God speaks for me, the beauty is how the word has knitted itself together with every prophetic word I've had by God. 
Okay? And now, it's the same thing. This sentence, the statement God gave me those years ago. Simple, simple, simple. I can tell you it's simple. And then, during that time, he was ministering to me about love. He was teaching me about love. And I tell people that these are some of the first topics that should be taught in discipleship class. We need to teach people to understand the love of God. First Corinthians, the letters of John, those sermons must be preached. These things must be taught to people when they've just received Christ. They are good for a reminder, but they should be part of the beginning milk. Then later bring remembrance to us. Are you hearing me? And now, he made a statement and he said, Love is the proof of the new birth. Seems simple. But when you say proof, and to understand what I mean by proof, he said, love is the proof of the new birth. That's obvious. Yes, it could be obvious to you. But as you continue to study the word, it becomes so deep, so deep. This I'm sharing is going to be simple, but as you continue thinking through, it's going to carry a deeper depth in your spirit. And that will define so much on how you connect with God and with mankind. Now, when he told me love is the proof of the new birth, it's that seal, it's that thing that shows that somebody is born again. Yes, with a heart a man believes and confession is made unto righteousness. Yes, that's salvation. But the full account of that proof is the expression of love. Do you understand what I'm saying? Without that proof, don't judge someone if they question your salvation. And I'm going to prove why. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 9, he says, But ye are a chosen generation. He says, A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Underline royal priesthood. He says that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He says, You are a chosen generation. Number one. A what? And a what? And the what? The peculiar people. Those four things. And he says that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He says you are a royal priesthood. Royal priesthood. Royal priesthood. Royal priesthood. So he's introducing the word royalty royalty are you hearing me in revelation he says that you're kings and priests and to the most high god in other words when you receive salvation the seal of royalty the nature of royalty the life of royalty eats you up are you hearing me so you're not wrong to walk royal you're not wrong to speak royal you're not wrong to react royal. You're not wrong to pray royal. Some of you, you are royal, but you pray like slaves. You understand? Father, I am nothing. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. There is something called false humility. It's humility, but it is false because it's not established. It's not rooted in the revelation of God. And so some of you have ways of humbling yourselves. Father, I'm stupid. I'm empty. I'm foolish. But you are God. You understand? Royal people don't pray that way. We are humble, but we know who we are. Some result, hallelujah. When a prince goes to the king, he knows what he's asking for. Even better, they call him the king of kings. Now, some of you, when you hear the king of kings, you think they're talking about earthly kings. <laughs> no. That was never God's idea. That was man's idea. Get us a king. An earthly king. So, God's idea was kings after his own heart. Men and women, which are of his life and blood you are true royalty somebody shout hallelujah and the day you understand it the world will treat you as royal 
Somebody shout, Amen. Amen. You are royalty. You are special. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are royal. It's in your nature. It's in your blood. Hallelujah. You don't tell a person, Oh, you're royal when they are. It's obvious. They know it. They feel it. Hallelujah. And so I know in my spirit that there is royal blood within me. And we're not talking about royal blood of the seed of men. No, we're talking about royal blood of the seed of God himself. Somebody say, I am royalty. The things of this world respond to me as royalty. Do you get it? Everything around me sees me as royalty. Every door I enter responds to me as royalty. In Jesus' name. I make you confess these things because you're planting seeds. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. So when I tell you speak, and then some of you just... Then after you come for counseling, I post things are not working. You understand what I'm saying? What do you mean to do? Confess it. Confess it. Confess it. Speak it. James chapter 2 verses 8. When he's talking about love, he says, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself you do well. Woo! Did you see that? This law, particularly this one, he says this one is royal law. Love your neighbors, you love yourself. That one is royal law. That law is for royals. Oh yes, but Jesus first said it in Matthew. Yes, but he wasn't telling it to royals. He wasn't telling them to love their neighbors, they love themselves, because he knew they could. He was telling them, love your neighbors, you love yourself, because he knew it was not inherent in them to be able to do that. So that they'll say, oh, so then how do I love my neighbor? Because they didn't know how to do that. When he says in Matthew, one of thy fathers, and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor thyself, he knows it's not possible for flesh and blood, no more human being, to do that. It's not inherent in the original nature, the Adamic. The highest form of human love, it doesn't matter how passionate, it doesn't matter how intimate, it doesn't matter how generous, it is still inferior. It still has an end and it quite cannot fully understand or even connect at all to the love God has expressed to us. That is why a man can love his daughter, a mother can love her daughter so much. And that daughter changes faith and he tells him, walk out of my house. And he loves that child. But he tells her, I never want to see you again. Because that's human love. He said, when this gospel comes, a father shall be separated from a son. A husband from a wife, a brother from a sister. That sword, he says, I come with a sword. Right? But you see, that sword really is the word. That the word sometimes when God comes into our lives, even the people who love you most can hate you. They can disconnect from you and tell you we want nothing to do with you. It happens. Are you following what I'm saying? And so this happens to human beings because the love of man is limited. It's frail. It's in a corruptible vessel. And yet they are also corruptible. Within nature originally, in and out. They are of a fallen nature. They cannot understand love. It doesn't matter how beautiful it sounds in the songs. It doesn't matter how beautiful it looks in the movies of Hollywood. It doesn't matter how wonderful it looks in your novels. It is still limited. I mean, they could even die for it. And a man can even die in love without even understanding what love is. And that is why sometimes I ask the adding questions. How much deceived are we without even knowing that we are deceived? Because the sons of men are sure they love. But how can they love? How can they understand love when they don't have a relationship with God? Who is love? Are you following what I'm saying? It's not possible. It's not possible. And so he wasn't telling his disciples to do because he knew they could. No, it was one of those laws they couldn't. Are you hearing me? So James sees that and he's like, Ha! Ah, this is a royal law. Not a law to the royals. No, but a law in the royals. You get what I'm saying? So in other words, the Christian should not love only. The Christian loves inherently. Now when you become born again, you love. You are a lover. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
you might still have your weaknesses of abusing, having bad manners, doing things to your friends. Yeah, 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 you can still have your issues. And uh, you can still struggle with your issues. But inside there deeply, you are a lover. Somebody shout hallelujah. Why? Because you're royalty. Unless you're not born again or unless your definition of salvation is not the true definition of salvation. We might lose people and they go to hell. And one day we get to heaven and you don't find the person who was in the choir. And you're like, but she used to sing. Again, this is not a thing that I'm intending to judge any man of because only God knows the hearts of men, okay? But what I'm trying to say here is that it is something that sometimes we need to give people to examine themselves. Even Paul at one point says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith except you be reprobates. Okay? We need to really confirm whether some people are really born again. But we cannot judge simply by their actions. That is only God to judge their hearts according to the word. Are you following what I'm saying? But some people, maybe, are what they are. Maybe, because they're not born again. And I'm going to prove that. Are you hearing me? So he says, fulfill, if you fulfill the royal law, he says, then, according to scripture, then the Bible says, then thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, then you do well. Why? Because he says, this one is a scripture of royalty. The precedence of this action to love is the light that you have received in God. Because you received God who is love, you find yourself that you love. Because you have God and God is love. You understand what I'm saying? So that is the royal law. It's the law of royalty. It's what makes you born again. Because you're born again, you're a lover. The Bible says the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Because you have that spirit that speaks in tongues, Reba, ba, 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 kasha. Yeah. that spirit that speaks in tongues is a lover. You cannot speak in tongues without that. Or if you're speaking in tongues and you're not a lover, maybe you're dealing with another spirit. I'm telling you. Hallelujah. But the Bible says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The Spirit of God being in your life, the moment He enters, boom, love is there. Why? Because you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So you might have issues with people, you have your tempers, you throw tantrum, you flip, you flop, you do everything, you fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But inside there, you're a lover. Because you're born of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so, by scripture now, I said to see God meeting up these things for me to understand. That love is the proof of the new birth. If you're born of God, you're a lover. It's the proof. Somebody shout amen. Can we go a bit deeper? First John chapter 3 verses 14. And now let's read from the Amplified. I want you to read the first sentence, all of us together. One, two, three, let's go. We know that we have passed over out of death into life by the fact that we make lame men walk. By the fact that we open blind eyes. By the fact that we cut out tumors. By the fact that we go on prayer mountain and spend there three weeks and come back with messages. By the fact that an angel came in our room no. He says, we know that we have passed over out of death into life by the fact that we love the brethren, our fellow Christians. Why do we over-spiritualize this thing into other things? Maybe because we are more of spectacular than we are supernatural. But when we shift from the mind of spectacular and go supernatural, not that we are against the spectacular, but if our spectacular does not define our supernatural, then we are in for a bigger problem. If we are originally spiritual, supernatural beings, then we must understand that out of death into life, that experience of transaction only takes place in the arena and atmosphere of love. When love is evident, then we know that we have passed over out of death into life by the fact that we love our fellow brethren. If you sit there in your life and feel like you can hate or act hateful or do something that would define hate, 
then you have to ask yourself, are you still in darkness or are you still in light? It doesn't matter how many miracles are working on your life. Because some even come, oh, we did miracles, we opened blind eyes, and he says, uh-uh, go away for I never knew you. You mean we can get to a point where a man will do miracles, signs and wonders, open blind eyes and death yes. in the name of Jesus, and he tells him, depart from me, I never knew thee? Yes. Because, for example, in Africa, traditional societies, where you were raised, before the gospel came, you were traditionalists. You used to do superstitions and you used to do a lot of witchcraft and some of you, you are generations of witchcraft. Physically we see you here, but spiritually you have many long lines, even some grandfathers are claiming you in seventh generations. You're a new creation, but they are claiming your body, yet you're a new creation. So, when we get into church, some of you, your genes are still connecting to the way your grandfathers used to. <laughs> so you come to church with the mentality of apostle. Check for me. Are you hearing me? Prophet, tell me. Who is bewitching me? Why? When? And the Lord revealed. And <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? You get my point. That... We cannot say that we have passed from life, from death to life, if we don't love the brethren. And he continues to say, he who does not love, abides, remains, is held and kept continually in what? In spiritual death. That means when you walk out of love, you're dead. You just don't know it, but you are. And how a person starts speaking in tongues, fasting, God, why are you working for everyone except me? And then you look into this dear man's heart, this dear sister's heart, and they are full of hatred. They are working with anger. And they somehow think God is going to bypass that. Eh? And put someone in their lives to pay the price of their anger. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Some of you are asking for husbands. But people can't even live with you for two days. And you ask you for a life partner. Two. They're enough. Everyone in your life is wrong except you. Do you understand what I'm saying? How are you going to run marriage? How are you going to handle a woman when you cut a wire every time? Remember the Bible says they are weaker vessel. You understand? Eh? So she might not adapt the way you want her to adapt. You understand that? How? How are you going to manage? You get my point? What are you asking for? You get my point? And, oh, but me, Apostle, me, I've prayed. <laughs> okay, stop praying. Love. Love. Oh, I've asked for a job for 20 years. I've done everything. I've fasted. I've prayed. I've worked. I, I, I don't think Fanero will help me. Let me tell you. I am so deep that I know that it's hard to find a person who is as deep. That one, I know it. It's not pride. It's true. <laughs> it's not what? It's what? I'm not saying they're not there, but they are few. So, again, you'll go there and still find the same word. Because you can run from the church, but you can't run away from the word. You understand what I'm saying? So how then do you walk in spiritual death and expect God to operate on your behalf and think that there somehow someone will wire a job on you? How? It's not possible. Some of us, the reason why we don't have the results that we should have is because inwardly we are dead. Outwardly, yes, we act like, but inwardly we are dead people. Why? Because we don't walk in the royal law. 
I told people, when you don't walk in love, you'll die. But some people never understood me right there. You might not die physically, but everything around you can start to die and you don't know why things are not working and you think maybe I need an extra prayer, a deeper prophetess, a deeper apostle, a separated teacher, do all that. You realize that the word is the word. This thing, he says, if you do not walk in love, he says, you remain held, kept and continually in spiritual death. Can you give life to anything when you're dead in the spirit? No. Hallelujah. Yet I still believe that because you're born again, that love is there. You're just suppressing it. But it is there. If you're born again, that love is there. Are you hearing me? That love is what? It's there. But God has given you choice to choose to let it work out of you or to stay carnal. Are you hearing me? Somebody shout amen. amen. And he continues to say in verses 15, anyone who hates, abominates, detests his brother in Christ, the Bible says is at heart a murderer. He is, or she is, at heart, a murderer. And you know, he says, that no murderer has eternal life abiding, persevering within him. He didn't say, no murderer shall inherit eternal life. He says, no murderer has eternal life. That means you're not born again. You understand what I'm saying? Because you say, you cannot hate, you cannot detest. And some of you say, I don't hate, but you detest. Detesting is murder. Detesting is murder. How can a Christian greet you and you ignore them? How can they call you to greet a fellow Christian and you say no? How? How? How can you refuse to greet a fellow Christian? How? Listen, no murderer has eternal life abiding within him. No murderer has eternal life abiding in him. If you have eternal life, you cannot murder. You cannot detest. We even greet our enemies. Our enemies. We greet them. You don't mean we're dense or dumb. No. Me, there are people. There's a man one time he spoke every evil thing about me. And I found him. Hello, hello. How are you, Apostle? Well done. We are hearing you. I looked at this guy. I was so shocked that I found myself hugging him. Yet the guy hits me left, right and center on social media. So, because I'm a lover, I just found myself, what? Hugging him. And I told him, let me add you more calls. You're pretending, but me, I love for real. And I held him like this. What up? You okay? Yeah, good to see you. But in my heart, I think he was like, oh my God, what was that? Are you hearing me? Because the Bible said, when you love, those that hate you, you put coals, you heap coals on their head. How are you? Somebody ignores you. Don't stop. Speak louder. How are you? <laughs> then they ignore you. I say it. <laughs> How are you? Because you're a lover. <laughs> you're a what? They have their issues. Let them go with them. Let them kill themselves. But you're not going to kill yourself like that. You understand what I'm saying? It's not right. Now, when he says no murderer has eternal life in him, he means, again, this is a proof of the new birth. When you're born again, there is no way you can hate even those who are most wicked. Even the most wicked people, there's a cast in you for mercy for them. Because they know not what they do. They know not what they do. Somebody shout hallelujah. That murdering thing is the nature of a fallen man. Look at David. David was a man after God's own heart. But because he was not born again, he could get a man, put him on the front line, kill him, take his wife, and not feel convicted at all. That's what the old nature looks like. Are you hearing me? Now, because of that, when you become born again, your relationship with God cannot be as of that of David. 
Because much as David was a man after God's own heart and there are tenets of him that define God for me, who is one of those people in the Bible that have defined the anointing. If I want to study about the anointing of God, I study David. For me, when it comes to the anointing, the heart of God, I see David. Okay? But I also must know that he was a man functioning under a certain covenant and a certain dispensation. And so there are things also in David that I could pick and say, mm -mm, this one is not for the new birth. You understand what I'm saying? It's not in your nature to hate. It's not in your nature. But you can't blame David because David was not full of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues like you are. The Spirit of God was not in him. It was on him. He was not a new creation. But you are a new creation. You cannot be like David. David used to say, oh, I celebrate over my enemies. La, 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 la. Yeah, you can't celebrate over the failure of your enemies. You cannot. In fact, the book of Proverbs warns, and it says that when you rejoice over the failure of your enemies, some of you actually don't know that. Eh? It says, rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, okay? And let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. For the Bible says, list the Lord, see it, and it displeases him, and it takes away wrath from him. Some of you, you interrupt God when he's dealing with people. Someone hurts you, they did damage on your life, and then when something happens to them, you say, Oh! Woo! Jesus! <laughs> Have you ever asked yourself why the Bible says, Vengeance is of the Lord? Do you know why the Bible says, Vengeance is of the Lord? The Bible says, Vengeance is of the Lord because He is the only one allowed to carry certain vengeance over His own creation. Your part is love. Let him deal with who he should deal with according to where they are at. Because even as he's dealing with them, he still loves them. So when the Bible says vengeance is of the Lord, it means even in his anger, it's of him and who is love. It has even in anger, his love. Some of you, you are waiting for the people who hurt you to get problems. You are praying, but you are waiting. That when they have a problem, you might even pretend like, sorry, sorry. But inside you're like, <laughs> when you feel that, check your salvation. There are people who have treated me so badly. Me, I've been abused in this ministry. Someone even abuses you and speaks a word to you. And you're like, eh. one time somebody abused me. I said, eh, you've abused me? And then they told me, should I add you? I said, eh. I'm telling you, some people are as a result of poor what? Upbringing. So I told her, you know, find another ministry to pastor you. Now, if I hear, because she abused you, she fell into a car accident, then I start to say, huh. Then I turn to my neighbors and I tell them, you know what happened to Gundi when they abused me? They got in a car accident. Abuse me, you'll see. You understand what I'm saying? You know, yeah, you'll see. You, you know what happened? Yeah. Try. And then you live in the fear of, don't abuse list. We're not supposed to abuse list. We fall into car accidents. No, we're not supposed to abuse because we simply are lovers. <laughs> and so, the Lord knows that if I had anything befell her, I would weep. Why? Because in principle, I see that Satan came and sat over her in her mind, showed her, spoke to her things, she abused me, but this is not her, this is Satan. His end was to steal, kill, and destroy. And so he started to dissuade her, mislead her, give her stupid words, information, understanding, interpretation of things. Consequently, I see that he's leading her through a journey of self-destruction. And if there should be any sort of destruction on her, I will weep. Why? Because I will know this was not her. This was Satan that got in the way of a good person and wanted to destroy them. And some of you, once your enemies get problems, you'll be like David. No, no, David was not born again. You are. We don't celebrate over the failure even of the worst people in the world. Because at the end of the day, you look at them and they are only but dust. And that they've gone on the way of the flesh and that Satan 
has taken away their life in deception. When your eyes open, you learn to pray for even those who hate you. You understand what I'm saying? That is love. And you can't have that kind of love and God does not build you. It's not possible. Some pastors come and tell me, what's the mystery? What's the secret of building a great ministry? Are people a statistic? Or they are individual lives? You just want to get a number that will open doors for you to go to America and put you in the world so you know you're a servant of God? Or does every life pain you? Have you sweated blood for them? Do you pray for them? Or you're just asking for numbers? No. Each of these people is life. Each of them is what? Is life. But some people don't understand that. They want the glamour, the splendor, the glory of big ministries. But they don't understand the burden. Sometimes I see people walking into service and I weep. It has happened several times where I just sit for walking in and I weep. Because every life, and I'm saying, God, what are they looking for? It's not that I don't know what they're looking for, but I'm asking myself that I better stand on that pulpit and give them the reason of why they come. And if you come out of service that day, and you came and you were all sullen, broken and hurting. And I preached something and it gets you from one level and takes you to the next. I have preached the gospel. Somebody shout hallelujah. And when that happens, I see the numbers continue increasing. Because we are ministering to a broken world. People need to be loved. People need to be loved. That is why some of you have not understood our simplicity. The anointing on us could complicate it. I have enough money to move with 20 cars, 60 bodyguards, switch off my phone. I have enough. And I can do it so you know that I'm anointed. <laughs> and I dwell in a light that you cannot easily approach. But love can't let me. It cannot. It can't. Because how? What if on the day you needed me most? Okay, if I'm not, then you should understand. But I try. You understand what I'm saying? That's why I still walk on these streets alone and still walk easily among you. Because I belong there. I don't belong in the light that is unapproachable. No, that's for some people. And I don't judge them. That's their calling. Mine is not. Jesus was with the drunkard. He was with the prostitutes. He was with the publicans. He sat down with the sinners. And for us men of God, we are in a light that cannot be approached. Do you understand what I'm saying? Love takes us back to men. Tell your neighbor, it doesn't matter how high God takes you. Never live where God is. And he dwells in people. He does. That is why when he's sick, they can't visit him. Because they're in the closet. When he's in prison, they can't visit him. Because they're in the closet. When he's hungry, they can't feed him. Because they're in the closet. closet. And he says, and whatsoever you did to the least that you did to me. God is in prison. God is in hospitals. That's where he is. Stop lying to yourself that he's on a mountain. He's not there. God is not on a prayer mountain. There is no mountain he has ever said I will dwell there. Even Sinai, he closed that story. So why are we on mountain? When people die? That's why we street preach. We don't street preach because we don't have enough anointing to be... Come on, I am anointed. Even you, you know. But there's a little why I get my thing and I got Nakawa. Because that's where Jesus is. 
Somebody shout hallelujah. He's not in our tinted windows. No, he's on the streets with men selling food. Hallelujah. And that's why I tell Fanero members, stay where the people are. Tell your neighbor, stay where the people are. Because that's where God is. Yes, he died for them. So, there was a fellow, a story of a man, great minister. He rose up in the early 90s. And then in that same time, there was another minister who was being raised. And this story was told me by an old man. And uh, this minister, these are two ministers. So one minister starts to have envy over the success of the other minister. And so they start to have small wrangles within them. And when they do for some time, one day, this one minister who was envied, okay, got into a scandal, big, big scandal that hit the newspapers. And now the minister who envied hard, and so he called a group of people and said, come, come, did you hear what happened to that guy? Yes. Oh, there's the way God deals with our enemies. He sent for soldiers, and then they celebrated. And then in there, there was a minister who was among that group of about five of them. And then when he was taking that sword as they were celebrating the failure of the other brother, it smit his heart that this is not you supposed to be celebrating the failure of this man. Then immediately stood up out of that meeting, went to the fallen minister and told him, I know you have a scandal, but I've come to tell you that we sat down in conversation and discussed you. And one even led us to celebrate on your failure and we'd even had drinks and toasts. And I'm sorry, that's not what becometh of the Christian faith. You're our brother, you're fallen, and it's painful that you are fallen. Forgive him, they had peace. This man, I later had the opportunity to meet. He told me with his own mouth that the rest of the people who sat in that meeting that day died in a shorter period, one at a go, one at a go. And told me, Apostle Grace, I'm still alive and all of those men are dead, except the one who came to say sorry. Don't play with the love walk. The spirit of that minister, I believe, started to die, and in the death of that minister came the physical death. Because maybe what killed him, he could have sensed and dealt with. This love thing is serious. It is the way of life. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so because of that, I have learned to love unconditionally. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, our children, my children, spiritual, you guys do things to us also. But I even bought a placard and put it in my office. Excuse the mess. My children are making history. You know why I put it there? If you annoy me, I look at it and remember that you're writing history and it will change. One day you'll become better. And then we shall look back and say, You understand what I'm saying? Because I have to believe in people that there is that good in them, even in their madness. So sometimes that patience can be abused. The patient endurance of God, the long suffering of God can be abused. And some people in long suffering and patience think we are ignorant. We don't know what they do to us. We do. We are just patient with the patience of God and extending love until the Lord changes you. But we are not ignorant. We're not ignorant. We're just trying to do what God wants us to do. And the people who we know do things to us. Someone who you wake up and they blackmail you, they backstab you, they gossip, slander, slander. I tell people that the words of a tell bear, they are as what? They are as wounds. And they go down in the innermost parts of the what? Of the belly. If it's negative, don't say it. If it's a rumor that you have not proved, don't say it. Because Satan moves through rumors. I hate the spirit of gossip and slander. Because I know what it can do. In 1 AD, Nero burnt a third of Rome 
and gossip and slander started going around that it was the Christians. They killed them by the dozens. They burnt men to stake. They burnt them on mountains. And a story is given that at night you could still see the bones of men burning on mountains. They threw some into gladiator amphitheaters and then animals started feeding on them. They stabbed some until Christianity was destroyed and decimated and people went underground and in the catacombs where people with leprosy used to live. Christianity was wiped off the face of Rome because of one rumor. And Satan has used that to destroy people over the years. Gossip and slander. And God says, when you do that, you're wounding. You're wounding. You're stabbing. If somebody continues wounding, what do they do? What do they do? Answer me. If somebody continues stabbing your back or stabbing your heart with a knife, what happens to you? you die. In other words, that's the heart of a murderer. Every slanderer is a murderer because you're killing people every day. How many are you going to kill? How many people are you going to kill every day? You're killing. And as you're doing that, you go on prayer mountain to separate yourself for a job. You go on a 40-day fast. So God will locate your partner. You go in overnight. So God would consecrate you and use you and anoint you. But every day you're killing. 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 And even after hearing this, you're going to kill another person. Because this is something we can preach for three years and still someone wakes up and stabs another. How many are you killing? How many destinies are you going to destroy? How many marriages are you going to destroy? How many relationships are you going to destroy? How many businesses are you going to destroy? How many friends are you going to break? How many? And you're the one who wants angels to appear too. And if God raises you up, you will kill more. So he's helping you to keep you there. Because the only way he can keep you alive. Please, don't ever sit in a conversation about another believer. If somebody starts sitting in Mugambe, I have a destiny. Why didn't you to them? I tell people, the moment they tell you, tell me, uh -huh, like you've said it, I'm going to take it back. So that I don't carry the what? They sin. In fact, many I ask them, ah, so how long do you want me to give you before you go and tell them? Because me, if I go, I'll tell them that you told me. No, Apostle, I didn't tell you to tell them. Me, I was just telling you that what? That they are even nothing. Oh, can you tell it to your face? No, but I was just telling you as their pastor. No, listen, even if I'm their pastor, if you have the grace to restore someone, go to them. If you can't go to them, do what? Pray. Do you understand what I'm saying? But don't discuss people. People are a work in progress. Some people, God is just working on them. But okay, leave them. Leave God's people alone. He will deal with everyone on their own level. And at their own space of time, yes, she'll produce out of wedlock, yes. But God will deal with her and raise her up and still use her. And then you'll stay there. Unused by God. I'm telling you, stop it, stop it, stop it, don't. It pains me when I hear people who speak about others a certain way. It pains. Because I see the devil speaking. Some of you, they just give you a simple rumor. This one is this. You don't even prove it. And this one lie? No, it's true. You take gossip. Huh? You start. Can you believe it? I was told. Then you start. And you're fasting. People Jesus died for. And in the spirit realm, spiritually, you are killing. But you want God to use you to give life. How? When you're killing the very things God is trying to give life to. Can your eyes open 
to the weakness of people and understand that people are weak and that Jesus loves them even in their weakness and that it's not your part to change people? Can your eyes understand that? Can your heart understand that God did not call you to change him or her? And only him at his right time he will deal with them? Do you understand what I'm saying? And then someone hears this, and tomorrow again they sit in a conversation over tea. Are you born again? That's why I'm asking some people, are you really born again? Are you really born again? Are you born again? Someone gets a job and you never talk to them again because they got a job. Something good happens in the life of someone and you never talk to them again because something good happens in their life and you want the same thing to come to you yet you can't celebrate goodness in another man's life and you say you are born again you want to attract what you don't celebrate what is in you what is in you what is in you what is in you ask people who get married that discussion always kills me do you know you get married and certain people never greet you again People were married. But do I have witnesses? Someone never talks to you again because you got married. I feel like, eh? So you loved that person before they were married? And now when good things happen in their lives, that heart has changed and you say you loved? I know people who get jobs and people never talk to them again. They were your friend when you still were working together. The day you got a car, she can't even answer your WhatsApp. Hey! You have redemption. Pray. Pray all you want. Pray all you want. Pray all you want. But there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Oh, the sister got promoted at work and eventually you become... Some people even hate people simply because they're dressing nice. Simply. When you are better, you are okay. But the moment you change your clothes, why her? Why her? And then someone starts to have an issue over a cloth. I rebuke that spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. That is from hell. It's not of God. It's not of God. It's not of God. It's not of God. God. It's not of God. It's not of God. Saints to look okay. If we are born again, let's be born again. Let's be born again. Let's be a new birth. Hallelujah. If a sister buys a car, give them the first seed of fuel and tell them I'm coming. I know you got it first, but I'm also what? Coming. Why? Because God has given it. Simply, God has what? given it. Now if you're even against God's hand to bless another, how then do you want that to come to you? How is it love when she was your friend in poverty? And when wealth comes in her life, she's no longer how do you say you loved her? Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, some of you love people at their worst. How's that? Men at their best? No, we have to be able to love men at all times. He says, this is the thing. He says, in verse 16, by this we know progressively to recognize, to perceive, to understand the essential love. He calls it the essential love because he said he laid down his own life for us and we ought to lay our lives down for those who are our brothers in him too. We have to. You know what it means to lay down your life? It means do not consider the happiness of yourself but the other. If they are happy, have peace. That's the Christian faith. There was a man who went and started talking about me, cult, cult, that one is cult. I even know who laid hands on him, a cult man, Musamchi man laid hands on me, who is cult. I said, okay, this is even deeper because the man who laid hands on me, I'd never met him. Well, he did it in the spirit, I don't know. But some guy commissioned me to cult. So the guy started talking. And so he started speaking, oh Lord, I had everything. What's your comment, Apostle Grace? 
I kept quiet because the love in me constrains. You know, love what? I had a friend years ago who were walking together and then some guy was walking and walked him and then he went away. Then he turned to me and told me, Grace, if I was not born again. <laughs> but the way he said it, it caught my eye. I stayed more curious. I said, what would you have done? He said, What would you have done? Mm -hmm. I imagined everything. You know, I have a very pictorial mind. Eh? So I imagined everything. You know, in primary school, people were like, you got your deep thinker as a deep thinker. Hello. So I started drawing pictures of the possible things this guy can do. Thank God we are born again. Because after some years of studying what he said, I realized that this was true with me too. That there are things, ah, if they found me when I was not changed. <laughs> do I have a witness? Indeed, the love of God constrains. Are you hearing me? Somebody can do something, eh? and then you start boiling a hundred kilometers. Boo, 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 boo. And then you say, but ah, I'm what? I'm born again. Calm down, Rebecca Grace. Calm down. This is what the guy impressed me over. So his issue, his challenge, was that they had hit him, and then he remembered he's born again. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Eh? It makes you smile even with people you don't like. <laughs> and you walk around. <laughs> because you're what? It makes you forgive the most unforgivable thing in the world. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's called freedom and liberty. If right, you're in this room and you have something on someone, I beseech you by the mercies of God, and I'll add on if you're born again, Muterero, release them to death. Hey! Kill it in the name of Jesus. Rebuke that spirit out of you and tell it, devil, go! Release people. Let them with God. And live your life full. You have a destiny. And so, one time I sit in a meeting of about three guys. And they're discussing this guy. And then they open a conversation. By the way, this man here. But is he really born again? Is that man really a man of God? He looks unstable. He looks confused. He looks this guy. Then they start speaking things. Eh? I said it in my head, eh? my heart. The kind of part of me saying, eh? <laughs> Now see. He called me cult, they are calling him cult. He's reaping what he sowed. So I enjoyed the conversation. They started talking, they talked, and as they are speaking, because I know the person, I say, mm, yeah, that one tick. And then he does this tick. And then he does this tick. And then he does this. Mm. Even these ones I've noticed. Okay. So I took my boutiques. But after everything, I realized they only knew 30% of what I know. Then the man of the flesh started telling me, <laughs> give them the encyclopedia. <laughs> they have a pocket dictionary. Give them a what? <laughs> because they were just giving a small little Webster like this. Me, I had the whole encyclopedia. From the word A to the last dot. 20, 30 percent. Now, the Chicano thing started. Apostle talk. Apostle talk. You get at ever money. Justify. Vindicate. Cry. Victimize yourself. Complain. And while there, it's a punch of God comes into my heart. Boom. He's my son. He's fallen, but I love him. And as though they had finished. One guy turns his but Apostle, you also know the guy. I just found myself saying, I don't think in there is a bad man. In there, there's a guy looking at me talking. He's like, <laughs> So I said, I don't think in me is a bad man. I just feel maybe he's someone struggling with something. I think the devil just, he just did it. But I think inwardly there he's a good man. The conversation closed. 
when it closed, I went back as like Nehru Vega Waroko. Ah. Vega Grace, you are born again. You are born again. Are you hearing me? I still have the encyclopedia. That's how I knew I was born again. That one for me told me, Vega Grace, I'm born again. Hallelujah. I love men. Tell it to yourself every day that I love men. First John 4, 7. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. And he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. If you don't love, you don't know God. But I made a lemon walk, yes, but you don't know God. But they see this woman and man pray every Sunday, yes, but they don't know God. They don't. They don't. They don't. They don't. They don't. They don't. A man had been attacking me one day and he came to me for a meal. And when he did, I went and said, God, thank you because he has come to me. Now let me show him that you are loved. I gave him more than a meal. Why? Because that was the only way salvation. Some of you, if we did not love you enough, You'd be out of the gospel, but we love you. We endure your madness. And then tomorrow someone is restored and they amaze you. You know, there are people who God has changed. I look at them in the ministry and I'm like, now if we had given up on this one. You understand what I'm saying? So the love of God, don't be quick to give up on people. Be patient. You will be amazed that out of that madness is a very sober person. Even more sober. There are people who look like they are composed. Nyinga, they are dangerous. They can even poison you tomorrow morning. Nyinga, they have never even had a fly. But they can poison someone tomorrow morning. So don't judge by what you see outside. Some people are very good people in here. Praise God. And it says, In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. Okay? And it says, Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. And it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, he says, then we ought to love one another. That means if when the revelation of God's love towards you hits you, you find that you love another person. If you don't know how much God loves you, you cannot love another. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> Say amen. amen. And the Bible says, no man hath seen God at any time, and if we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. And hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he has given us the spirit. Again, you remember? Because that's the spirit that, that, that tendeth, that constraints, that shed into your heart this love of God. And then I want us to skip down into verses 17 of that same verse. Okay, begin from verse 16. He says, And we have known and believed the love that God has towards us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. And herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Unfortunately, people love only that kind, because as he is, so are we in this world. Woo! In fact, when you're preaching, say, Because as he is, so are we in. Yeah, yeah you say, you know your lines. But. This line is not complete without what happens up there. And the Amplified gives it clearly. He says, in this union and communion with him, love is brought to completion and attains perfection in us. And because that love with him is brought to completion by perfection in us, are you hearing me? Then the boldness comes because as he is, so are we in this world. In other words, you cannot be like him if you do not connect, if you do not relate with the love revelation. You cannot. Don't claim that line without respecting the up one. And God will use you as much as you love and respond to his love. And to know that for us love is a natural thing that flows out of our new DNA. It means everything you've been doing outside you is not you. That's why I tell people, don't regard men in the flesh. Keep looking at them of who they are in the spirit and believe that if they fail themselves let them fail themselves but let them know that you are patient with them somebody shout hallelujah 
because that's the only way God expresses his love. I told people that for me, I have had people, I've seen, I've researched, I've researched history, I've seen men who do miracles. I read of a guy who used to speak at people and limbs grow. I saw anointings, I read anointings, I've moved in the anointing for many years. But nobody has ever expressed to me love like one woman who one time I met back in a fellowship, back in the day of the church I used to go to, who came with her husband in Uganda. She was an old American lady, and the Lord impresses it on their hearts to adopt a child, to look after as they grow old together. And then they go into sunny baby's home, see the beautiful kid, because, you know, when you're looking for a child to adopt, you again move on, they will, they will test come. The human being thing comes. How is the hair? How is the skin? It, I don't know why, but it happens. And so it happened, and they saw this wonderful kid, but some kid caught their eye, little kid in the corner. They go back home, they lose sleep and appetite over that, and the next day they come back and say, you know, we wanted this particular kid, but the Lord is drawing us to one girl in that corner. There was a girl, and this was the story of that girl. The mother threw her at birth one week old on a dustbin, garbage dustbin area where they throw garbage. And then one guy was driving on a rainy day and hears the voice of a child. And it was drizzling, it wasn't heavy. So he hears the voice of a child. And I think he sees something wrapped somewhere. And he says, Isn't this a human being? So he walks to this child and then gets this child and then takes the child to an orphanage. And then, but later it was discovered by the doctors that this child had a. Uh, an illness. I think it was mental retardation, Down syndrome. It was all a mixture of many things. And because of that, this child will never move, according to science, never talk, never speak, never see, never. The child was crippled from head to toe. And God tells this American woman, this is the child I sent you for. She adopted that kid and brought that kid before us, and the kid was about 12 years old. And I looked at the kid, I started weeping. Because this girl's eyes were up in the socket, the hands were like that, the legs were folded and cringed, and the, hand, the leg was like up like that, the head I mean, and it says, my daughter has never talked to me, she has never walked, she has never clapped, she has never told me a story, never laid a joke, never carried a baby, a doll in her hands, never rode a bicycle, never played with a friend doesn't have friends because she can't speak and can't see well and can't hear well. When she passes, you know, her pass, urine and everything, I clean her, I change her diapers, I wash her every day, I carry her to bed every day, I sit with her every day, I walk with her every day. And she said, I love this child. Now if you're a mother, just one active infant for eight months, and even make you forget to do your hair. Grabs this, you take away. <laughs> Come here, no, ah, they eat. You understand? Get a cockroach, put it in the mouth. Get out, spit. You understand? Now, just the fact that they cannot even attend to the toilet is enough to tire you. And this she has done for 12 years. And she said, ladies and gentlemen, I love my daughter so much. And she said, and it's through this that God has proved to me that he loves men. And for me to see an American woman that traveled 10,000 kilometers away to come and adopt someone, a mother, through on a garbage place, on a dustbin. And even for that child, God created a home and a life to live. No anointing, no love has ever been expressed to me ex like I saw in that woman that day. That story has stuck with me since then. That's the thing that makes me walk in the hospital and I'll sit down with a sick person. Because what she goes through every day to love, let me tell you, human beings are not easy to love. More so when they're not able to do things for themselves. You understand what I'm saying? Even just the lame man who, cri who cripples on the road and is dirty, some people run away from, you get my point? Because it's just human nature, the old fallen nature. But when I saw this woman do that, for the first time I saw love in its most perfect sense. And no minister has ever ministered to me like that woman. None. Not even the most anointed. Because I saw love. I saw love.
unconditional love. I prayed for that. I said, God, eh? that is the thing. That is you. That dies so God. Somebody shout, Amen. May God cause us to love even the worst. This is not supposed to be something new. It's supposed to be a sort of reminder for us. And some of those reminders that are timely for God to remind us that we must walk in love. We must walk in love. Open your mouth and talk to God. Talk to God. God is dealing with us. May God help us walk in love. May God help us walk in love. May God help us walk in love. May God help us realize just how much He loves us. the unlovable. May you be patient with those that are hard to cope with. And may you see the best in others always. And may you find it so easy to forgive. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you're there and you say, you know, after hearing you speaking, I feel I need to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want to be born again today. Speak Jesus after me. Say, Lord Jesus. My heart breaks tonight and humbles to your love. Today, I choose to believe in my heart and confess that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. I'm born again. Tonight, you are my Lord and Savior. Help me. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.